I've laid out for a number of you my vision for this state. I've laid it out in, in, me, in, 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 in chamber events. So I won't reiterate it in great detail, but I will remind you that as I have often said, and it's as old as time, it's in a timeless proverb, it's biblical, I suppose, in its origins, but without vision, the people will perish. It's true enough. You could say the same for any nation, for any state, for any company, for any chamber, whatever the case might be. Without vision, the people will perish. There must be a vision. There's got to be some kind of vision that unites us and brings us together. What is that? What is it that we will espouse? What is it that we will rise to? How is it that we will, in fact, become the best version of ourselves? How, in fact, is that going to be possible? My vision is a simple one. We're not going to be everything to everybody. I had this conversation with somebody earlier this evening. There are many things we might be able to pursue. But if you chase two rabbits, you don't catch either one of them. If you chase 20 rabbits, you just lose your breath, and that's about it. The reality is there is much we can do, much we are doing. But it is my vision that we become, bar none, the center of engineering and manufacturing excellence in the United States of America. It's 100% possible. If I were to ask you if you wanted something engineered and manufactured to the highest degree of excellence, you had to do it in a single country in Europe, where would you go? Had to do it in a single country there. The name that popped into your minds, I guarantee you, for probably 99 plus percent of you, is Germany. Is it because that's the only place? Of course not. You could do it in any number of other countries, but that is the name that comes to mind when you think of engineering and manufacturing excellence in Europe. You think of Germany. Why is it that a room full of people in America think of that? If we asked a room full of Germans or people in Europe, what would they think of if they had to go to a single state in the United States to engineer and manufacture something to the highest degree of excellence? Where would you go? We might come up, they might come up with 10, 15, 20 different answers, each one as true and as defensible as the next. If I were to ask this room, you might say the same. Some would say Kentucky, but truth be told, there are many of other states that you might name as well. And so what does this tell us? This tells us that nobody owns it the way Germany owns it. Germany owns it in the world's mind as it relates to what's done in Europe. But nobody in America owns it. And if no state in America owns it, what else does that tell us? It's available for ownership. We're going to own it. That's my vision for Kentucky. It's not that complicated. We will be the engineering and manufacturing hub of excellence in the United States. In order for that to be possible, we need to attract the kind of employers, some of which you've heard mentioned tonight. We have to attract people who are reinvesting in this state, like the Toyotas and like the Fords, who have invested billions in this state and make products that go the world over that are topped by no one in their respective spaces. Those things are already being done, and indeed, they're pouring in. Companies that are innovative and are, are, are shattering all sorts of, uh, of, of ideas about how business should be done that are disruptive in the truest sense of that word. Companies like Amazon choosing to build their world shipping hub here in this state, that will have a profound impact. Companies like Brady Industries and like Enerblue who are transformative. What is it that all these companies are doing besides putting dollars in the ground? They're investing in our people, but they are here because they recognize the opportunity and the excitement that is possible here, the things that we can do here in Kentucky. And those seeds that are going in the ground, if we nurture those seeds and we fertilize those seeds and we water those seeds and we hoe those seeds and we tend that garden, these seeds will grow. They will germinate the seeds. The roots will go deep. The fruit will be born for generations to come. It is a collective effort. It involves a whole lot of work across the aisle, intra-aisle, within parties. I would say this, and I say this not to be facetious. Historically, people have gotten up here and made jokes and had, and I'm, and just for the record, I did this last year and I apologize. I'm already running short on time. I'm gonna run over. If it dings, I'm gonna ignore it, so help me ignore it as well. But I'll try to keep this, this, this uh, brief, but I'll say this. There were comments made up here by good people, people who come and truly do serve. But I'll tell you what, it's ironic to me that some who've come up here and espoused certain things voted against every single piece of legislation that helped this chamber win Chamber of the Year. That's a fact. And so did their colleagues. You can get up here and talk a good story. And those of you that are out here who are supporting the things that happened in Frankfurt recognize that what David Osborne said is true. 
There is a certain party that's going to do the heavy lifting, and I would encourage those in all parties to be part of the solution. Because truth be told, economic development and job creation and putting these seeds in the ground and the fertilization process that's involved legislatively and otherwise to make those seeds grow should not be a political issue. Should not be. These things are necessary. It should not be controversial to bring competition into public education through charter schools, and yet it was. It should not have been competition to bring right to work to this state, and yet it was. It should not be controversial to repeal prevailing wage in this state to allow us to get so much more bang for the buck, hundreds of millions of dollars more bang for the buck for our school systems and other infrastructure problem projects, and yet it was. Why is that? Because partisanship and politics have made their way into the legislative process, and that should not be the case. It just shouldn't. And so I encourage you as business people to encourage, regardless of your political affiliation, I received a lot of grief when I was elected by putting people into cabinet level positions who were both Republicans and Democrats. It was considered an apostasy to some that I would choose somebody from a different party. I'm agnostic when it comes to the competence of a person. I don't care their party. I do want the competence. I want people of good character, people that are competent, people that are committed to serving. You should expect the very same from every single one of us in the House, in the Senate, in the administration itself. These are the things you should expect. We have so much we've gotten done. A year ago, about this time, it was the fifth, two days after I spoke to you last year, we had the most extraordinary, momentous, unbelievable day we've ever had in the history of Kentucky, arguably in the history of any legislature anywhere in the United States of America. It was an unbelievable year in which so many of the things that ultimately did lead to this chamber being recognized as a national chamber of the year were accomplished in a single week. Then my hat's off to the House and Senate because those very same people who did it, so many of them are at the helm again this year with even more experience, even more energy, and even more willingness to get the job done. And we're going to get great things done. We are. There have been distractions. There have been things that have taken our eye off the ball. You know what they are. We don't need to re reiterate them. But I again would ask of you, expect of us that we who are elected officials, we who are the ones representing you, expect of us that we will hold a high standard on all fronts, that we will have a high moral standard, high integrity, that we will exercise good judgment. You should expect nothing less of us. If in fact we do these things, as we have largely done, the upside potential is extraordinary. Last year, I stood on this stage and I challenged so many of this room, in, in this room, to be bold. If you were here and you remember that, I, ch I said, I hope the next governor and the next governor after that and the one after that are in this room. And I challenge those of you who are business people to get engaged in the process. We need men and women who understand how the wealth of this nation is created to be involved in making the policy that affects our ability to continue to produce those jobs and that wealth or not. This red tape reduction initiative is more than just a cute and clever thing. It is done intentionally to make it easier to do business in this state. And I hope you see that. I hope you're feeling it. I hope you are excited by the fact that not just winning of awards, but the reason we're winning awards in this chamber is because this environment has become one that is a magnet to people around the globe. $9.2 billion of capital invested. The previous best year we'd ever had ever was $5.1 billion. Nearly double the best we've ever had and we're just getting warmed up. It is transformative. Some of these companies that I have mentioned to you, including three of the new players, the Amazons, the Bradys, the Enterblues, these are the kind of companies that are transformative and because they attract others and there will be peripheral players that will come and be a part of this, you should be excited about this. Why did people come to America in the first place? Why was this nation founded? Why is it that they came to the U.S. and to Canada, to this continent from other places, risking their lives to do so? They came here because they wanted better opportunity for themselves and for their children because they wanted less oppression and less suffocation by government. That's why they came here. Do you want anything less? 
Does any one of you, do any one of you as, a, as an individual, as a parent, as a business person, I don't care what country you live in, I don't care what part of the state you live in, do any of you want anything less? Do, anything, do any of you not want what's best for your children and your grandchildren? Do any of you want more oppression and more suffocation and more regulation by government? Of course you don't. So what is it we're going to do to become the best version of ourselves? The key is not just to come to these dinners, not just to shake hands and back slap and feel good, get up here and say the right things, or assume because someone said the right things, they're going to actually do the right thing. Hold people to account. Give of yourselves like you have never given before. Again, I say this not to guilt trip you, but you've heard some up here, Senator Jones among others, who will not be standing for election again. I hope somewhere in Pike County there is a businessman or a businesswoman, not, a, not someone who's not that, but a business-minded person who's put their own capital at risk, who's created payroll, that will step up, step in the gap, and come to this town to represent the people of that community. The same for every other community. We need to have men and women who will serve in the ways that are best for the Commonwealth. Not for themselves, not for any particular constituency. There's much that could be said. I'm already over time. I'll say a couple final things. There is a lot of work yet ahead of us. The budget is going to be brutal. We've said it. It's been quoted. Those preceding me have acknowledged the same thing. We don't have any alternative. The reason being is for the first time in certainly a very long time, we're going to pay our bills. We're not going to put things in there that we don't budget for, but that we know we're going to accrue the cost of. We're going to actually fund the pension. We're going to level dollar fund the pension. If this pension system, this pension bill doesn't get passed, and I believe that it will because the votes are there to do it, and if we can get other distractions behind us and get to the task at hand, which is what your men and women you've elected want to do and we will do, that when in fact we get that done, it will alleviate some of the pain. I'm telling you, if it does not get cost, the cost, if it does not get passed, the cost to cities and to counties will be so prohibitive, all but a few will not be able to pay it. That's reality. It will be tens of millions of dollars for certain cities alone just to meet the statutorily mandated requirement of contributions. This pension bill has got to pass, and it will. But even if it does, it's been fascinating to me to see some in the media pick up on this theme by those who, for some insane reason, especially because they're the beneficiaries of a solid, safe, sound pension system, oppose the idea of doing anything to it as it, as it devolves into nothingness. This theme that was picked up on is that the cost of a pension bill is going to cost the state more. It will cost more money than if we do nothing. Well, of course it will. That's what happens when you pay your bills. If you walk into a store, you walk out without paying, it costs less than if you actually go to the register and pay. That's how it works. That's how it works. And for those in the media, follow along. That's how it works. The reality is we're going to pay our bills, and you're going to see a bill, you're going to see a budget bill that will be sobering, would be the best verse, ver, verb that I could use to describe it. It will be sobering. I guess it's an adjective. It will not be a pretty picture. But the bottom line is this. It must be done. We are going to pay our bill. But I want you to be reminded of something. Even when we pass this pension bill, the cost right now to you the taxpayers, to your employees, to those that you know and work with in your communities. The cost is high. It was last year, in each of the two years, over $1.8 billion, record, most we've ever put in. I made a point of funding that. It will be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars more. We have fewer than 10% of people who are either retired or actively working that are in, citizens of this state. Far fewer than 10% of our citizens have ever worked in or will work in state government. And yet it is consuming 20% and climbing of our entire budget. So people can get up here and appropriately derive applause and good sympathies and good feelings by saying we need to pour money into this, that, and the other thing. Of course we do. We want infrastructure. We want education. We want all the things that anybody would get up here and espouse and every one of us would want, but they cannot be paid for if we don't have the money. In the state, we don't have the luxury of printing money like the federal government does. 
We have one of the worst credit ratings of any state in America. We don't have the ability to borrow, and if in fact we do, it's limited not only, but also the cost of it becomes prohibitive. We must get our financial house in order. And the idea that it now is 20 plus percent in climbing of our entire state budget is going to pay an obligation that has been kicked and kicked and kicked down the road is reprehensible. It's unfortunate. But it will be addressed. And while it will be tough times, and nobody would want to be the legislature or the governor that's making these kind of decisions, they've got to be made and they're going to be made. It's what we all ran for. It's what we came to Frankfurt to do. And we're going to get it done. I want to close with this. I want to, let me say one other thing and then I'll close. There's been a lot of talk about things that need to be done. And I would encourage you, take a look. I was going to go through some of the four pillars. There's four pillars in this book that's also in front of you. And the areas that are spelled out that this uh, chamber is advocating, workforce, I could give you examples. You've heard some of them of the things we're doing to pour hundreds of millions of dollars into workforce. It's happening. It's being transformative. It's why some of these companies we mentioned have come here and why others will be coming. You see government reform of government, and these things have to happen. Not the least of that is, is having, you know, the kind of policies, red tape reduction, et cetera, infrastructure we talked about. And then the fourth one is jobs. How do you get jobs here? You get jobs here by doing these things we're talking about, taking our financial responsibility seriously. And to those in our legislature who have been sounding the alarm for years, many in the Senate in particular, I applaud you and I thank you. And I'm grateful for the fact, but now the work must be done. It's no longer a function of, well, we talked about it, we tried, we must succeed. We've got to get these jobs done. It will not be easy, it will not be fun, but it will be gratifying and it is rewarding when in fact people come and create jobs. We're creating jobs like we never have. We're creating investment like we never have. And we will continue to do it if we get our house in order. Our credit rating will rise. We have gone from about 48th to now 40th in terms of workforce development already. And other things are coming. We have an 1115 waiver that will be coming from the federal government that will allow us to transform and to lead the nation on how we engage people in their own health outcomes to ensure that we as taxpayers get a better bang for the buck and to understand that the purpose of entitlement programs like Medicaid are not meant to be a dead end. They are not meant to be a destination or a trap. They are meant to be a way station on the point from people in need to the point where they are self-sustaining other than those for whom the systems were originally intended. All this is not lost on us. Those are the things we have to do. Tort reform must come. You see it spelled out in here. We've got to have uh, additional tort reform. We've got to have caps on punitive damages. This is an apostasy to some in the, in the legal community. Well, I'll tell you what, this should not be a playground for trial attorneys. People should have their opportunity. They should. They should. But Kentucky is known globally as a place where the, the pickings are easy. And the pickings should not be so easy. For those in our healthcare community, in our retail community, in our manufacturing sector, if we are to be what we are capable of becoming, we've got to be responsible about the limitations we put on how much those who create the jobs and opportunity can be punitively uh, harmed by frivolous lawsuits. People need their, their day in court. People need to have a redress of grievances. All these things are true enough. But we do need some serious tort reform. And I'm grateful for the fact that bills are already making their way forward on that front. The last thing I want to say to you is this. I want to share uh, a story. It's not really a story. It's a fact. Some of you have heard me share this. It's what I want to leave you with as a challenge. In addition to being bold and stepping up and being willing to be people that would put yourselves forward to join some of those in Frankfurt. I want to encourage you, no matter what your walk, whether you do it publicly, politically, or otherwise, I want to encourage you to please think about this. In the Middle East, on the other side of the world, there are two bodies of water that are about as far apart as Lexington and Louisville. They're about 65 miles apart. I guess they're a little closer even than Lexington and Louisville. They're both fed by the exact same source of water. One river feeds both these bodies of water. They're similar in size. One has an abundance of life in it and around it. People fish, people play, people swim boats around it. Water is taken from it to fertilize fields and, 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 and water fields. 
There's an abundance of, of, of economic good that comes from it. 65 miles away, a similar sized body of water fed by the exact same river, dormant, dead as a doornail. No life, no fish, nobody around the edges of it other than curious people who come to see this wasteland. What's the difference between these two? They're both said, fed by the Jordan River, same river. One is known as the Sea of Galilee, one is the Dead Sea. Why is one the Dead Sea? The Sea of Galilee receives water from the Jordan River, takes it in, and it gives it back. The Dead Sea takes it in, it doesn't give it back. I ask of you, I beg of you, as leaders in your communities, in your companies, in your families, in your churches, in your civic organizations, as in your chambers, don't come to these meetings, listen to these stories, be inspired by whatever, encourage one another, and then leave here and don't do anything about it. Take it in, but give it back. Please, I beg of you. Kentucky needs it. Kentucky needs you to step up like you've never stepped up, to take in and to give back. Because that's where vibrancy comes from. That's what leads to economic success. That's what makes for strong trading partners. The upside is so bright indeed. Somebody asked me early on in my tenure, they said, what would you define being a successful governor? How would you define it to be successful when it's all said and done? And I said with really no facetiousness, and I, and I mean it even more than I ever did, success to me will be when the governors of Tennessee and of Indiana and of Florida and Texas and North Carolina and wherever, when the governors of those states wonder why, and maybe the provinces of, of, of certain uh, you know, Canadian uh, provinces, well, the, the premiers of those provinces, when, when these individuals wonder why their children have to go to Kentucky to get a job, that will be success. And I mean that sincerely. Think about that. How many of you in this room have a child or a grandchild where they've gone to another state to pursue the opportunity that they wish they could have had here? That's what we're looking for. Let's make it happen. Let's check partisanship at the door. Let us do what is economically to our advantage to do. Let us trade with those with whom we need to and must and should and want to trade. Let's broaden those relationships, strengthen those relationships, but let's take care of our own backyard as well. Encourage your legislators. It will be a good time. I will close with this final thing. Be loud and bold. Because those who oppose everything that you stand for, that you pay your dues to have this chamber represent, those who oppose these things, who want more of your money and don't care whether it's indiscriminately spent or not, they are loud, they are organized, they are the squeaky wheels. They light up the phone calls, they light up the desks for these legislators. Be loud. I challenge this chamber, be, this chamber, be organized. Be the people, you're busy, you're paying taxes, you're employing people, you're coaching your children, you're at PTA meetings, I appreciate that. But take time to encourage positively and to affirm your legislators. They need it. They need to hear from you. Kentucky needs you. The future is bright indeed. And I'll tell you, I'm honored and privileged to be a small piece of this puzzle that we're putting together. It's something extraordinary. Thank you for all that you have done in the year just past. I look forward to the fact that the future is bright indeed. May God bless you and may God bless the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Thank you.